So how many of you consider yourselves educators? How many of you teach? So my main job is not to teach uh, undergraduate or graduate students. My main job is to give workshops to professors. But I also teach a course in um, How many of you are researchers? How many of you consider yourselves writers in some ways? Maybe not necessarily doing research or writing in other ways. Um, and how many of you uh, do MOOCs and things like that, either creating them or taking them? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, how many of you consider yourselves lifelong learners? Yes, hopefully everybody. And you're really disappointed if someone doesn't think they are. Um, I want you to take a look at this. Has anyone ever seen this before? What do you see? Opportunities now. Opportunities no way. So, what, why do you think I was showing you? Why do you think I'm showing you? It's, it's your choice to grab an opportunity. Any other thoughts on why I was showing you this? So, it's your choice for to grab an opportunity. What else? I think it's both of those things. It is what we're sitting with right now is you can do a lot and you can get overwhelmed by the dark side of somebody sitting here. I think, I think it's just a quick uh, sort of a summary, I think, of what Liz was saying. <laughs> They're both there at the same time and they sit together. You can either choose, but you also need to choose to see both, I think. So it's not only choosing how you will act, but to continue to see both. The vigilance of both sides, maybe even more than two sides, there might be multiple sides, right? depending on whose perspective it's coming from. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen these uh, like pictures of designs in the physical world that we use to make us think about how we design the virtual world, the education world. So I'm going to be doing that several times throughout this presentation. And the first one is a question for you. Whom does this kind of bench welcome, and whom does it repel? I'm going to come to this side of the room. For whom is this bench a welcoming bench, and for whom is it, you know, you want to sit on it just? I think it welcomes individuality, but it doesn't accommodate uh, people that want to be close together, like families. Because of the divider, right? So, both mother and child, and the child wants to be close to the child. I think that there's another way of looking at this. Of uh, course, we're individuals, but differently. As much as you're my wife, I must be able to. I think for me, even if it has divided us, there's still an opportunity to become one in the sense that they are able to talk with each other. And I think it welcomes anyone who passes there and who would like to grab the opportunity. Any other thoughts on this one? It doesn't matter the person <laughs> as long as you're on the same page. That's what matters. Yeah. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to ask this question because you, got, you guys sort of started to answer what kind of social behaviors and encourages of this part. Sometimes uh, this kind of picture of a bench is shown, and then we question whether there's a discriminatory design. Does it discriminate, for example, against homeless people who might need to lie down on the bench? 
um, or is it helpful to the elderly who need to, you know, have someone tell you to be able to get up and sit down? If not? So it's, it's, it's like this opportunity is all right now here. It depends on whose perspective we're looking at to see whether it's a helpful design or not. And then I really like the kind of points that we were making about how we can think about it in all these different ways. And I think when we design online and blended and digital, and even in class experiences, it's important to see all these different perspectives. Like when I design it this way, whom am I discriminating against and whom am I empowering? Um, I heard this expression in Kosa, and I, I hope I will be using it correctly in my next slide. I'm actually thinking of creating my next slide. Um, and it, it's a slide about myself, and I am who I am because of a lot of people from South Africa from recent years. So I just wanted to mention them. Um, some of them are from South Africa, some of them are actually speaking, but they're not South African. <laughs> some of them are not here anymore. Um, but those people have influenced my thinking. As an Egyptian who works at an American institution, I'm bombarded with Western way of thinking. And so often, it doesn't resonate with my context. And so all of these people are people who what they share on Twitter, the conversations I have with them. Those are the things that resonate with me a lot more. And I'm so happy to be here with people who have a more similar context to mine. So, and for example, Paul Prisou from UNISA, tweeted this out just yesterday the day before, and it's actually quite relevant to what we're talking about today, you know? Or you're talking more about Amazon, <laughs> just mentioned Amazon, and precarity, and, and we're just talking about precarity. So these are things, these are actually relatively global trends, but also how they apply in our context like differently. In my particular institution, the American University in Cairo is based in Cairo, follows an American way of education, but it ends up being something hybrid between the two cultures. So the professors and this are from Egypt and the US and other countries. The students are mainly Egyptian, but they have different educational backgrounds. So some of them grew up in American education, some of the British, some of the different schooling, a few mixed with a few others. So it's a hybrid institution in a lot of ways. And the students, it's a private nonprofit. So Students pay standing there, some of them on scholarships, so they're mostly privileged. But of course, in other ways, just like the Egyptian from the global south, they are underprivileged in other ways. So there's this combination of um, their, their own you know, power and less power in the same person. And just to clarify, because we're talking about fees here, Egyptian higher education, Egyptian education from kindergarten up to even. Masters and doctoral level, Egyptian public and higher education is free. Officially, you're paying half of it's only very small, but um, in reality, you still have to pay a lot to be able to, to go through it. And especially in like engineering and medicine and those kinds of fields, there are other costs that are not explicit that you have to undergo. And there are other problems with the quality of education. In my institution, classes are small, people pay for this. Um, but the quality of education they get is a little bit more um, than what they would get in the Now, I realize that our contexts are quite different. Um, we talk about discourses of colonization and decolonization. Those conversations don't happen in the same way we did, but I learned a lot again from what we talked about in South Africa. Um, and it influences the way I think about digital education, education in general. Because again, you know, I live in this post-colonial situation all the time, and being at the American institution makes me think about that a lot more. Because I'm always like, faced with it, I'm faced with the, the inequalities inside the institution itself all the time. And you know, I, I just updated this slide right now, which is appropriate given what it says. So we're talking about making a plan, but a lot of what I talk about today is about even though you make a plan, you gotta be ready to update modify, revamp the plan according to what happens, right? So making plans is really important. And taking things into account is very really important, but then how do you react and when actually the plans don't go as you plan them to go? And um, so just very quickly, I know you're not all from the same institution, right? So you might have different um, resources, might have different goals, different uh, audiences, student bodies. And I wanted to know 
why do your institutions go for blended, like your online and kind of digital learning? Is anyone willing to share like what the purpose of going online other than the high level school people? <laughs> Does anyone willing to share? Or is it too long ago? Yes. I think it's it's a very complex answer. We've been asking the question of the why underpinning these things at Kanawashi University quite a bit. I think it's if you ask different stakeholders, they'll tell you different things. It's an economic reason and the idea of the learning earn market and the wider market is <laughs> wonderful those kind of things. And then it is the idea of access and speaking to the new generation. It's not the idea of and sharpening our own understanding of digital and academic literacy. So I don't think any institution will be able to give you one answer that everybody agrees with. Okay. And uh, okay, I do have another question because Laura brought up blended learning that everyone will be using blended learning. Do you generally define blended learning as just integrating both or do you define it as canceling face-to-face -face time? Just integrating both uh, because that, this is something that's going to come up later. In my institution, we follow the OLC online learning consortium definition of replacing face to face time with online, calling that blended. And then that confused all our professors because some of the literature just means integrating both, uh, and they keep saying, Well, this is what I'm doing, and we say, You know, so I'll talk about that. <laughs> okay. Are there any particular challenges that stand out to you here? I mean, you're all here, obviously, to talk. About this in each other, yes. So, for our university, we need to, um, we've got pressure to increase student numbers, but the infrastructure of the town actually cannot support more bodies. Uh, as folks know, at the moment, we've got hectic drought, um, so that's sort of one of our pressures for one. Really it's kind of a temporal thing, a situational thing. Okay. Any other particular challenges that people would like to share? Yes. Uh, we went over to that because of the fees must fall situation. Although we already had it go because of physical space limitations, free education, so, so there's so many people coming in, it's just not enough space. And the fact that it's a comprehensive university, so that the analysis must be able to collaborate. So those were part of the rationale for, for doing um, the blended learning, thing. although the misconception was with the classroom, because it was originally a primary school from theory. So, the idea is not to record a lecture and put it up now and even watch it on YouTube. So, so what happens, and I was doing it, and we just thought it might be better if we introduced the flipped classroom in a different way with chunks of information that you might put there. So, so this, it's, it's not too complex, but for us it's clear in that option. The third stream income is really an outflow of what we have. I think one more and then one more. Okay, two more. The rule is makes it very difficult not to discriminate. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for us at Tunisia, because we are primarily a distance education institution, we we we, we find that going online, we try to preach what we most say about the training. Transactional distance that, that, that becomes inherent because of the nature of our uh, offerings. But then we, we find that going fully online because of the scale of our student numbers becomes a, a real challenge in terms of the, the real activities that have to go online, but then there's a massive numbers. Very, very big numbers. Well, for me, I just hope that uh, I'm not going to do Laura's term a disservice because she mentioned this nice terminology called um, 
cultural um, capital. So I hope that I've framed it very well. So I think for me, it's the lack of it. If we don't have that, no matter what you can do, you can bring all the beautiful systems, you can attract the people to, to the, the, the finest uh, hotels or restaurants, whatever. But if you don't have that, that's not. Uh, I'm glad you brought this up because one of the things that came out after your MOOCs became, you know, like an organized short time education is that the MOOCs will give you the knowledge, but they won't give you the cultural capital. And cultural capital is almost half of the reason why people go to college in the first place. And first of all, how do you develop cultural capital for the face to face world when you're learning online? And the second one is you actually need to develop cultural capital to learn online well. So that, that's, that's really the point to develop. So just a quick comment about that. I think what we also challenged to do in this school, to think about in this country critically, is this is sort of notion of different forms of cultural capital. So it's not about, I think that's what we have faced a lot, is this sort of received, if you like, cultural capital, and what we do with that, and the extent to which we negotiate that, change that. Um, I'm using I'm using I'm using the yeah, deauthorize some of that and reauthorize it all the country capital. And we were just talking about that also earlier as well. Um, the, you you want to on the one hand not dismiss completely the importance of the Western and the white culture, you want to learn from it, but you need to look at it critically and at the same time bring up all the local and indigenous cultures and, and bring them up and then thinking about beyond education and into the work environment and into citizenship, what kinds of cultural capital do you need to develop for that? Okay, um, so I'm going to go soon into sort of themes that uh, I want to go through with this keynote and then also specific case studies of practices at my institution. Just to let you know, to, to teach an online or blended course in my institution, the people need a special approval. For that course, based on course design, the face-to-face -face courses, you need to approve the course design in general, and nobody really knows what's happening in the classroom. So it's a little bit more uh, pressure to, to do that. But our definition of blended is we can't take face-to-face time. So if you just want to integrate technology into your course, that's fine. So nobody looks at that. Um, we do more graduate courses online than, than undergraduate, because they're kind of canceling things, but a lot of the undergraduate courses to integrate technology in some way. And we also have some long degree courses that are not part of a master's or bachelor's degree. And we're trying to do more deep blended than online. And so the majority of courses in general are in English. There are a few things that are often Arabic because what we realize is if you're going to do something online, it's available to everyone in the world. And therefore, if there's an English language version of it from Harvard, why would they want to do it from UC? Unless it gives like a Middle East angle on doing business, then it would make sense. Or unless it's an error and that it doesn't exist one like in the So that's, that's sort of why we do some stuff in that. It's not our usual. And so underlying things for today, has anybody seen this one or a similar one? So I've chosen this particular one. I like it a lot more than the one with the baseball field because my Egyptian students don't know what baseball is. I don't think you guys play baseball here. I don't I don't understand cricket at all. It's a lot from here. So um, but I, I like this one more for several other reasons. Does anyone want to offer comment here now? So does it make you think about Okay, I'll take this one comment. My understanding of the balance from the first time I wrote this slide today is that every participant there has got a great chance to go on to, to get the target as equality. Whereas every day, we're making some provisions 
but the less privileged to also be able to reach the as you can see, which are going to improve his own access to the target. Thank you. Thank you for me, one of the interesting things about this particular one is you said the word target. And there's the assumption that everyone wants an athlete. And I remember Shimon uh, Goliavichi was saying once that she went to the child, she wrote books about apples, but they don't eat apples, so she grew up in mangoes. <laughs> so, what is able to jump up? At least he sort of can do it. And so give them the agency, you know, allow them the agency to try to reach it. Um, but anyway, I think, think the general ideas of these, I'm sure you're all familiar, familiar with, but I think it's also important to ask ourselves, do we need to give everyone an opportunity to reach the same target, or like, do we actually need to give different different things that they need, options. And I also want to think about you know, we talk about access yes. to the beginning of the degree, but can they also finish the degree? Can they feel welcome in the degree? So when you think about hospitality, well, hospitality or hospitality of, of the spaces that we create for them. Um, and I remember Lauren, which was maybe five years ago or something, uh, which talked about quality of access does not mean quality of outcomes. And so thinking about not just how people reach the right for, but how they end and what happens in the end. And understanding that maybe the same intervention might be empowering for someone and disempowering for another, and it's contextual. And there are some of these things that we can predict ahead of time, especially if there's not participation from a variety of groups. And sometimes you don't discover these things until you try them, and you learn from them, you try them, and you change your plans at the end of the time. And it's really important also to notice um, exclusions and absences whose ideas are not being taken into consideration, whose interests are not taken into consideration in our designs, in our processes. You know, I was just thinking when I was filling out the South Africa visa application, my child decided to help me. And she noticed the different groups were like married, single, widow, and so on. And then I was doing a survey for something completely different, like a couple of days later, and she realized that there was a missing category. Said no, but the category for widow is not available here. I said, well, I'm not married. I said yes, but there's a married with children, single, and widow. What about widow with children? Where's that category? <laughs> and I think the person who did that survey didn't realize that. Obviously, they didn't think of every single person. And I was thinking, how is it that the child could notice something like that that someone who designed surveys wouldn't? Um, and so I think thinking about my child is eight. So thinking about, for example, Sometimes we don't involve students at certain steps of a process because we think they won't mature enough or they won't know it, but sometimes they know more than we think. Uh, even young children are not even just uh, university students. And this other thing, um, someone uh, yesterday was talking to me about finding the best fit. And the word best drives me crazy. <laughs> I, I think, you know, serve best practices, get some on my nerves. It's always a good practice for this context. And there's also this idea of when, when someone critiques you, you say, well, I'm doing my best. I think there's always an opportunity to do better for some other group of people who maybe you were doing your best for what you could see at the time or for the audience that you're used to. But now you have a different audience and maybe you can do better. I'm happy that people like this, because <laughs> I'm sort of telling everyone you have to keep working harder. Um, and as a parent, I always feel like I can do better, which maybe I'll work myself out doing that. But, <laughs> um, but you know, and, and I'm not saying this to say that people should burn themselves out at work and never feel like they're doing enough work. It's about noticing for whom you might need to do a better job and for whom you're not necessarily doing that. Um, and I'm just reminding myself of you that a lot of sort of the visions of what digital is comes from the West and it often excludes some voices. Um, I wrote this article with um, uh, a friend from South Africa here, Paul Prince, and Australia, people. 
actual time zones, for example, is one of the very interesting things. We have a lot of um, you know decontextualized and culturally irrelevant things for us. We talk about that. <laughs> I'm going to go through five cases. I was originally going to ask you to choose the order of them. And I think we've had some interaction already, so I'll just go through them. And if anybody has any questions or comments in the middle, please raise your hand and I'll come to you with the mic. So the first one is about asynchronous learning. Back in 2014, I wrote an article called An Affinity for Asynchronous Learning. Uh, this was at a time where my child was two, two three years old, um, and it was very difficult for me to meet someone on video at a certain time synchronously because I felt you know, my attention a lot of the time. And it was also at a time where I think there were a lot of electricity cuts. I don't know what the situation here is, I'm assuming different cities and different rural areas might be different urban areas. But getting not having electricity means people not having internet, or you have to use your mobile internet, which at the time wasn't very strong for synchronous calls. So I was writing about pedagogical reasons for doing asynchronous learning, like uh, reflection and sort of like better, more equality, because there's no limitation of time and space in the same way that you have the synchronous conversation, but also pre pedagogical reasons. You know, people won't be able to even access the learning environment if you do it synchronously. And so asynchronous means more people will be able to participate in the first place. Um, are there any uh, are there any particular considerations that you think about when you design online learning and you include synchronous or asynchronous that you think about? Is this something you guys think about a lot? Yeah. Money? Okay. Video, yeah. <laughs> so if someone's going to be saying this, it's not my um, unlimited uh, Wi Fi. Yeah. Um, so, what happened is when we designed courses, online courses across the Arab world in Arabic, and two Egyptians who can't come to campus, and we said, do an online blended, we said, you know, do we asked the teachers to design a lot of asynchronous online discussions and not to imagine that, oh, I'm going to replace the face time, I'm just going to meet them online for two hours and talk. We tried to teach them that. But what happened is the ones who were in our continuing education who were learning in English turned out to not be comfortable writing in English. When they go into class, the teacher has their slides up in English, but they talk and make sure they're everything in English so that the Learning to understand. I don't know if you have a sense of the, if this is a concept of understandable here, but you know they sort of know the terms, but they don't have conversations. And then writing and, and having it written for other people to then read later was very intimidating for the students. They didn't want to read a lot of English or write a lot of English. Neither did the teachers, because they're professionals, they're not academics. They don't want to spend that much time. They come to class for two hours, it's done, it's over. And how do you do this? And then to grade the participation there, and to be told you can't just tell them one post and that's it. You have to actually read the post and, and give them rubrics <laughs> and other things. And that was a big council for them. So they weren't ready for that. And then, you know, we were thinking, we, it wasn't enough that we teach the teachers how to design an online course, but how do they manage their time effectively and information overload? And then we realized that we were teaching them how to design online blended courses, but we weren't teaching them how to facilitate online blended courses. <laughs> so we leave them, we design the course, we rub off, we sign off on that, and we leave them to deal with it. And then we realize, actually, no, they need more experience facilitating an online course. And then we give them a course on design an online blended, it's kind of blended, but they don't get immersed in this online discussion thing so that they feel comfortable enough to design their own and to facilitate. And one of the Great thing is that Emerge Africa, which is part of UCT, have this facilitating online course. And we were like, oh, we need to do one of those. Uh, so some of us took it to the one that they have, and their curriculum was open, so we could actually just you know, copy some of their stuff and modify it and use it in that content. So we're, we're doing that now. Um, and so, yeah, so sometimes we've been teaching people how to do something for a while and they don't realize why it's going wrong. One of the other things is this. So that our continuing education, the idea is that profit making more than the rest of the world. Nobody profits from it. It's a non profit 
institution. You want to make money. So they think, oh, so I'm going to have 100 students. Like, no, if you have one teacher or 100 students, they're not going to be able to teach that course very well. Like, they're, they're not going to be able to achieve your many outcomes. It's going to be less quality. And the question is, I don't want, sometimes when people don't know about online education, they think oh, they say, I've taken an online course with 10,000 people. And you know, most of us sort of spoil that for it because when you pay for online education, you expect more. You expect assessment, you expect interaction with the instructor. And so then working on that as well, like saying, well, if you're going to have that many students, you're going to have to need more teaching assistants or more instructors. You can't just let the students do quiz and say, you can now you cannot take this certificate and without making sure that it has quality. I have no idea how you got it. Maybe so you were trying to work. <laughs> Then we have large numbers. Um, and then the other thing is sometimes people at my institution who are higher up think that video is needed for good quality online education, whether it's synchronous or not synchronous. I'm also trying to say it depends on the context. Sometimes those people don't have time to watch video. You know, just their the teachers, they don't need the video, not going to add anything sometimes. You know, so so yeah, so it was all about noticing the exclusions where we're not doing, who's needs of priorities where we're not addressing, and how will best practice didn't necessarily work with our local context. And again, reminding people that just because online might be more accessible doesn't mean it needs to be less. And I'm gonna go back to the point Liz was making about recording recording lectures. I mean you mentioned this as well. But what could be the downsides? I understand accessibility for recording lectures, but what could be downsides of recording lectures to in person and online? Has anyone had experience with them? Or do people object to it on the campus? I think one of the issues that all institutions are struggling with, especially contact institutions, is class attendance. So a lot of the issues raised by academics is what is going to happen to my attendance, and there are pros and cons to it that we can consider. Um, as far back as 2009, I had a thought to record lectures. But it was quite difficult because some days you wake up feeling well, the other days you don't pay uh, fluently, the other days you stand up for some odd reason, you don't understand, then you want to try to resort to having to record students reading their own manuals that I, I created them for them. So I had to, they had to read and I had to record them and then use their own recordings throughout the, the, the course. <coughs> Because I just felt that having to record the lectures was <laughs> a witty task. Um, some of the other things that came to mind at my institution that people objected to recording lectures was sometimes being recorded changes the way you teach. Just knowing that you're being recorded is almost also a little bit like being surveilled in some way, like you don't know what someone's going to do with the video. If you're talking in a class where you're talking about political issues or something that becomes a real issue that who's going to see this video. And then students themselves, if it's a discussion-based class, first of all, logistically, it's a kind of discussion recorded, but also that some people will speak less if they know it's being recorded or not speak at all or speak differently. Um, and for example, I love when I'm being a keynote that this one gets on stream, but I need to know that it's going to get live streamed because there's something I won't say. I'm not going to get myself into trouble. <laughs> Hopefully, you know, not at all about when people watch it, but, <laughs> but it's not still. If it's going to get recorded, you need to be really careful about what you say. So, like, for example, this next case is about um, an MIT collaboration that we had. Um, I've, I've got more details in the publication that's coming up, um, but I'll talk about it a little bit now. So, I don't know if, if you've had anything similar to this. I'm just going to put you in this place I was two years ago, where I was told there might be an opportunity for my institution to collaborate with MIT. How do you think your professors, your lecturers would react? How do your students react? Something like that. Really good smile. How do you think? Has anyone had something similar? Or can you imagine, like, if you were told 
you know, some of my tools and stuff, and an opportunity to collaborate with MIT. How would your professors feel about that? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So in my institution, what happened was, uh, I yeah, you put in, in the, the word MIT in the email, and everybody would respond to you right away and they call you back. So that was the good one. Opportunity to collaborate with MIT. So this, the faculty were very happy. We thought the students would be happy because we thought they'd feel like, hey, I'm taking a course at UC and then I'm going to it. They weren't. You know? Even though like, I have a lot of uh, students come to my classes wearing MIT t-shirts or sweatshirts because they wanted to go there, but they couldn't so they ended up here. So they're not very happy to be here. So they want to say, oh, by the way, I'm one of the people who are going to come to But no, they weren't so happy. Um, because among the challenges, so this was funded by an, an Arab uh, institution. There was no money going back and forth between us and MIT, but they brought in MIT to work with us. Basically, MIT have their MOOCs on edX, they call MITx MOOCs, and they have some in the STEM disciplines, so science, engineering, and so on. And so what they said is, we want to redesign some courses at AUC and the American University of Beirut to have MIT content with them, and we want you to do them blended. First of all, we define blended differently than they do, so it's just confusing for everybody. Um, second of all, our priorities were to be blended and online for graduates and non-degree courses. They wanted this for introductory undergraduate courses where they think we have large numbers, but we don't. We have lots of sections of small numbers. So that kind of thing applicable. Um, they're supposed to be moves and they're supposed to be open, <laughs> but what ended up happening is, first of all, we do it, they were helping us, you know, sort of Suppose that they edit parts in and out, you can only edit out entire pages. So if the professor wanted to use just one exercise from a page, students get confused because they have to see the entire page. And the instructor for our institution couldn't add things in the middle of the other one, and they couldn't integrate it into Blackboard. So the students were going crazy now to do it in different places. So that didn't work out very well. So it's supposed to be open, but it's not really adaptable. And it's also, they couldn't promise us to give us this forever. So what ended up happening, our professors who were teaching maths and biology who integrated MIT in their courses, stopped using the textbook and used the MIT material, which had quizzes and videos and text, instead of the textbook. And they redesigned the entire course so that the materials sort of match. And then, you know, maybe two years in the future, they might not allow us to use it anymore. Or they might make us pay for it while we are doing it free. So it's sort of, how open is open, what does this mean? And then we had people from MIT come in and train our faculty on MIT pedagogy, which was interesting and nice. And you know, near the end of it, they said, actually, you know, people have time to go learning and teach you could have done this. <laughs> we didn't really need experts, like five, six experts from MIT to come in and do that. And they said, you know, you know what it's like. You bring me from Egypt because people are different than someone different, but it's not, it's not that I know more than anyone here. Right? And it's kind of the same as that. But one of the problems is, you know, some of the people they brought up are quite senior, but some of them were like PhD students, so they're not even really that experienced, and they're coming to teach other faculty who've been doing this for like 15, 20 years, so I'm not really sure how they get to choose who comes to train us, or is it enough, or didn't feel great to do that? And one of the people was more experienced, but she really wasn't a good teacher. So I'm not really sure why she was here to teach us about teaching. So. You know, this reminds me of um, an article that Nicola um, you know, shared with me earlier about when people from the West bring in workshops to people from this part of the world and who they choose to come to teach us and how do they know what we need to know so that they can be useful and experience for us. So it was kind of useful, but that was, I think, a little bit more said in terms of who they chose and what they did with them. Um, and, and what I saw is that a lot of the actual professors from MIT came in were very altruistic to work. They did want to help. They wanted to do something good. Some of them were from global south originally before they went to MIT. They did want to do something good. But the institution had all these restrictions on them so that they wanted to give us a lot more flexibility and so on. But they did. The tech support people didn't want to help. So when we had really big technical problems with their system, it took so long to fix it. And the students got really frustrated with it. And then the 
four professors simply got bad evaluations from the students because of the system that was outside of their hands. And so here they were trying to innovate in their pedagogy. But they took a risk, and that risk affects how they get evaluated, and then whether the department keeps them or lets them go. So that was an issue. And so who, who has the authority to make those decisions? And when they make those decisions, they keep power and balances, or can they? I'm just checking the time. Okay, I don't have a lot of time left. I'm going to go slightly fast with this. Yes. You mentioned a lot of challenges in that collaboration with the MIT, but I think uh, from my own perspective, the whole collaboration was flawed because you needed to know the culture of MIT and the culture in your institution to base your collaboration because things work very differently in MIT. They never train staff members to use technology. They teach themselves. So I, I'm not surprised they brought you PhD students who don't know what they are doing. And yeah, I, I just feel there was very little thought about uh, the collaboration. People just went with the name MIT without knowing that they, they, they do well, but some of the things cannot be replicated in some of the contexts. Because of the kind of staff members we have and the challenges we have. I mean, there's an assumption there that with that content you can do stuff, but there's so much context in processes and people and the preparation of the people. The students, of course, are prepared differently, they're selected differently. I might be selective, right? So they get different kinds of students with different kinds of participation. And the, yeah, the shiny name of MIT, so the administration really wanted this, right? And with the retail grant, well, it tells us. Okay. Um, Intercultural learning experience, and we have to go really fast with this. But one of the things is in this world where in Egypt it's very difficult now for international students to come to Egypt, so digital forms of intercultural learning are important to develop global citizenship and things like that. But there's also a lot of power and balances in that. Like who designs those learning experiences? What kind of pedagogy do you use? So, for example, when we do intercultural dialogue using video, obviously infrastructure wise, some people in certain parts of the world have slow internet connections. Getting disconnected, or their video is off with their audio is on. Um, the time zones, like how you like the times, and the use of English language usually as a medium of communication is, yes, it's good it's somewhere in the middle that most people around the world will have as their second language, but it still privileges those who are fluent and it privileges those who aren't. On the other hand, you can think about it as in the people who speak more than one language have more knowledge and more cultural knowledge across the world than those who just speak one language. Um, so it's, it's always, you know, there's a spectrum of hybridity and how far each person, how many steps each person needs to take to be able to have these private conversations. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Uh, and I just wanted to make a point here about when we talk about empowering learners, one of the questions people ask is, well, what kind of privileged learners do I need to empower them? And, and one of the things to uh, think about is we have a mix of learners or some Empowerment, some are not. They sort of model the idea of empowerment and agency so that hopefully, whenever any of those students have the power themselves to make those the design spaces that are more equitable, maybe they see that and think about it themselves. And again, very quickly in this one, we have uh, the, the most that my institution works with are with a platform called Idrok, which is uses, it's based on edX. So edX for MOOCs, you all know edX, right? They're, they're open source. So then doing it in Arabic and making changes to it was quite easy. The problem with it is like, we actually just replicated the Western model, took those moves, saw how Alex was doing them, to, did them the same, but in Arabic. They're still free, so we, we don't, they don't charge for most. But Edrok, which is a Jordanian um, nonprofit, they get to choose which MOOCs come from our institution, not us. So we have a group of MOOCs that we think could have, you know, we propose some, they choose the ones that they want, they don't know the professors very well, so maybe we can go to some choices that we would have made strategically for ourselves. Um, 
And, and one of the problems with the design of edX, for example, is that it's only good at STEM type of questions. So they do quizzes like multiple choice. And I say, well, I'm doing a social policy, but how am I going to ask multiple choice questions? And they don't have a solution to that. They don't have a pure they don't have a open ended. So it's, it's a struggle to try to do that. But we have similar, similar to international trends and like very low completion rates and things like that. And that we have those solutions. I'm going to skip over this one for now because I'm going to go to the closing thoughts. Is that, yeah, I know I'm actually probably over time by now. Yeah, five minutes, okay. That's good. I really do have five minutes. I thought I'd have less. All right. Um, so, just thinking about a lot of the trends in education technology, like learning analytics, like AI based vision, section like Turnitin.com, and automated grading, is always to think about for whom might these things be helpful and for what purpose, who decides how we use them. And if we're going to be forced to use them, how can we use them differently? And talking again, like best and going better, is to think about I don't know if any of you are used to this kind of image where. You know, if you're at the top of the mountain in one of these, you feel like you're the best, but you're the local best. So this is not the global best. You might be the best somewhere else, and it might be better for someone else. So it's always to think about the better of the best. And then thinking about, I'll, I'll show you some images of tables. It's almost lunchtime, so this is a good time to look at tables. <laughs> um, and this is a quote from another South African, by the way. Uh, so thinking about marginalized groups being forced to join global trends and looking at these things and thinking if we have parity, have you heard this term parity participation? I heard this from Cheryl at ACP, <laughs> which is based on the anti creators model of social justice, is that it's not enough for people to participate, it's important for people to stay on par with each other. So that when we're designing digital education experiences, that we think about that. So for example, in a table that looks like that. How welcoming is this table for someone like Shirley Chichon, who is one of the first African American congresswomen and presidential candidate? Is that if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair? How comfortable would you feel bringing a folding chair to a table like that? Yeah, not very comfortable, right? And remembering that is only entrance to join the party, that's who you are. And what about succeeding in it? So what about this? Would you be comfortable bringing the folding chair to this one? You look better yet, people are not age. They all look different. Is there anything about this that makes you uncomfortable with? The closeness, because you might not be comfortable to be that close, right? And also all facing the front, you're not looking at each other. And this one? Space and the first place. Yeah. The, the recognition that maybe you have something you want to say something? Don't go down Oh my god, I didn't, I didn't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's kind of appropriation. I think we will appropriate the primary colors. <laughs> Just primary colors. <laughs> we have the, maybe they need to move like the maroon and the pink or <laughs> something. But so they, they look the same, but they're different colors, so it's not completely different from each other. So there's a bit of harmony there. So maybe not everyone would feel comfortable with this. Um, and this is like being on the floor, like in some little in the in the air world, I don't know where else that happens. So who would, who would that be comfortable for? Who would that be welcoming for? In some cultures, for some groups of people. And maybe in certain contexts, so not, not maybe for someone who's on a wheelchair. They make nice for a child who doesn't sit up on a high chair. Um, and this is a campfire. A lot of times in the West, they use the term campfire. I don't know if you guys used to just talk about like an informal atmosphere that's very welcoming. And I realized that I hate to use that term, but I've never actually been to a campfire. I've never been one of those. And at a certain point, my daughter used to be scared of open fire. I'm sure some people don't like being in that context, or maybe again, the closeness to close, maybe it's too hot, uh, maybe it's too informal for some people. It seems more welcoming than the, you know, the formal chairs, but I know you can't for a lot of people. What about this one? 
For whom would this space be inclusive or exclusive? People don't drink my coffee, so I can't drink. Who else? Who else would be uncomfortable with them? You have to have very long legs, yes, yes. You're climbing on these, yeah, yeah. I mean, the first time I showed the images of the table, someone mentioned the high chair, so I went and looked through this picture, right? Yeah, that's good. And I, I don't know how they keep doing this. Like, they really change that design. Maybe it's to make sure that no kids go over there. <laughs> there are still people who are closer to some. Um, and I'm going to just mention this term, intentionally equitable hospitality, that a group of us in my organization virtually connected talk about, which is being hospitable and nice uh, is good. But thinking about being equitable as you do, it means that you might extend the hospitality differently to different people. So for example, with online learners, just saying, hey, everybody can participate, is not the same as sometimes reaching out to a person who's shy or a minority or is struggling. You might to do something different, extra, go do something private, wonder if you need to change something about your design to be more welcoming, especially for minorities and marginalized learners. And, and perhaps if you don't immediately see how to do that, then maybe it helps more people in that kind of group to be able to respond to their needs. Um, and so I'm just asking you to think about this throughout the next today and tomorrow about what would it mean to, to do that in your context. To think about equity issues and thinking about this. This image is I'm very surprised from Microsoft. But it's really cool because it's talking about inclusive design and thinking about how someone, for example, might be deaf, so they're permanently deaf, or someone might have a hearing infection, so they are only temporarily deaf, or they might have a situational disability, like because their bartender is noisy right now. So thinking about in your designs that. How to address the needs of all these different people. Because you know, you might say I don't have any blind students in my class, but there are these situations or temporary situations where they might be. And thinking about all these different things and to do that and how to work around these considerations in our practice. Thank you. I went two minutes over. Does that mean you can take one or two questions? I can can, can we lunch. wait for lunch just for one or two questions? Yes? No. <laughs> Anyone want to ask anything? I think people I think people will talk to you over lunch, yes. Maha. Can we please give Maha a big round of applause? Thank you very much.